If you remember watching my night one review of WrestleMania 37, which if you haven't checked out, you absolutely should, which you would get automatically to you if you subscribe to this channel or even follow the show on Twitter, which you should do all of that. I was saying for all of you that were talking about how great WrestleMania was and how great of an event it was that we still had a whole other night to go. Don't get too far ahead of yourselves. You have to know how the WWE operates. They're going to take any goodwill or good feelings that they generate from the audience and find a way to totally undercut themselves. And you're going to be sitting there praying to God, ugh, that our tribal chief was going to save the day in the main event in night two. How you feel now? Those of you that were talking about how great WrestleMania was, you had a whole second night. And my God, <laughs> do we wish we didn't. This was the drizzling shits until the main event. That's a whole different conversation. But it started off right away. Oh my God. This has to be one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time. I know it's not recency bias. It's not getting caught up in the moment. It's not anything other than the fact it's one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time. You spent several months building up to this shit. Apparently Randall Keith Orton was mad about Drew's dick spot on night one of Mania. He says, you think your ring boner is going to get involved when you try to jump over the ropes? Well, fuck you. I'm going to come out and wear white. Why are you wearing white? Because of the colors of WrestleMania? Apparently it's victory white. Being bold with the raging ring boner. And what I'm also trying to figure out is, you know, the man was burned alive, yet somehow he was able to salvage his previous gear. So just showing once again that child support indeed is never going to put over Bray Wyatt or The Fiend as he has to wear the exact same clothes as he did before. And outside of the thing where he was talking about Michael Cole, that is a box-like structure, which makes me beg the question, does Michael Cole describe vagina as a box-like structure? Um, apparently, not only is child support not putting over Bray Wyatt or The Fiend, but apparently neither is The Breakfast Club. What the ever-loving fuck was that? From the box at the ring, do 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 your asshole, you were buried forever. Now go the fuck away. Imagine trying to sit there right now and spin this like Bray Wyatt the Fiend is not buried. Oh, you gotta wait for the story and see how it plays out. No, the fuck you don't. This was the story. It was months. And it's not like Randy Orton had to go to the lengths of hell or anything to beat him. It was basically one RKO. Bam, it's over. Hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. Oh my god, Alexa Bliss was there and she was sitting in a pose that was reminiscent of maybe Aleister Black or something. Where are you going with that? Who fucking cares? The hell was the point of all of this? The only way this makes sense at this point in time is that we got a revelation on the Raw after WrestleMania that Alexa Bliss was pregnant. And it's all a big custody battle of who, Maury Povich type shit of who's the daddy. Is it Bray Wyatt or The Fiend? And whose child support going to go after? You say, well, that's stupid to talk about. Not as stupid as this fucking match and everything leading up to it. This, this is what you fucking did? The Fiend's revenge match and he loses in under six minutes? That is buried. There's no argument. We could have discussions and debates and arguments about other things, but you don't get it on this one. It's over. The fuck is the point anymore? As soon as that happened, that just seemed like a foreshadowing. Of what was going to come later in the night. And the courage of WWE to show us a reminder later on in the night of what the hell happened. Why would anybody want to be reminded of that? And to those of you that are talking about that women's tag team championship match that it wasn't that bad. Keep this in mind. Somebody in WWE, perhaps multiple people, said Bailey doesn't get a WrestleMania match at all. But we need Tamina and Natalia to get one on each night of WrestleMania. Criminal imbecility and stupidity of the highest order. Ding dong, dumb dicks, what the 
fuck did you expect was going to happen here? Oh, this match was good. No, it went a long time. It went way too damn long. And all of you a-holes talking about this match was good. Natalia botched a fucking hot tag. They stood around her and Tamina, look a couple of AEW idiots, waiting for Nia Jax to splash down on him from the top turnbuckle. The body slam spot between Tamina and Nia Jax looked shitty as hell. It was worse looking than Lex Luger body slamming Yokozuna back in 1993, and that's saying something. And after all of this and all of that, almost 15 minutes of match time, one of the longest matches of the night... And let me repeat that. One of the longest matches of the night. You did all of that just so that way the champions could retain. So you did months of story just to have Randy Orton beat the Fiend any fucking way. You do this match just to have your tag champions retain any way. What the fuck is the point of any of this? And after those first two matches, I figured a lot of people are going to be all giggly tits about Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. Now... I've been converted to being a Sami Zayn fan because he actually decided to become a character and become interesting. And I'm glad he got this one-on-one -on -one match at WrestleMania. But I wasn't a huge fan of having to see him and Kevin Owens fucking again. This is lazy as hell. It's almost like the way Vince looks at it. Sometimes he used to look at it with ADR and Rey Mysterio. Hell, they're both fucking Mexican. Let's have them wrestle each other on SmackDown for months and then we'll do the same thing on Raw. It's like he treats the Canadians the same goddamn way. And for as much as you were talking about this and all the history there, and as many times as we've seen them wrestle over the years, you needed to see something different, something special, something more, and you didn't fucking get that. So stop pretending like this was great. It was not. It was nothing great. It was nothing special. It just barely got started, and it was basically over. The highlight of the match, a worthy highlight, but that's not saying much, is Logan Paul eating the stunner. Other than that... It was a basic garden variety match that you would have expected to see on SmackDown, not at fucking WrestleMania. The United States Championship, I don't care how much you wanted to associate RVD selling his fucking rolling papers or whatever the hell with Matt Riddle, it can't save the fact that Matt Riddle absolutely sucks. Like even the graphic of him kicking the fucking flip flops off, the bird shot out of his ass late. Well, that sounds about right. He had multiple botches here. Him botching the jackhammer. Sheamus almost botching the white noise where it could have been really nasty, but he managed to save it, so good on him. The only good thing about this match was two things. The finishing sequence was awesome. The fucking bro kick like that was fantastic, and Sheamus won! This is an example of where it left me a little happy to see some Breakfast Club rules business once again. Because Matt Riddle sucks! I don't understand why anybody likes this ass hat until I realize that the same idiots that like that ass hat are the same ones that used to get their jollies off of Joe, Joey Ryan's dick grabbing gimmick. Ain't hard to understand dealing with morons here. Well, that match was a bossy fucking mess until the finish. Oh, and then your Nigerian drum match for the Intercontinental Championship. It can't just be a street fight. It's got to be an ethnic street fight because that's what Vince thinks is fucking supposed to happen here. Like, this had the potential to be really good. Apollo and Big E were doing the damn thing. For those of you that are surprised that Big E would lose in his hometown, what are you smoking? What on flat earth are you talking about? What reality are you living in? Of course Vince was going to have Big E lose in his fucking hometown. But the whole thing was... There are times where run-ins make sense. There are times where run-ins are not overbooked crapshoots, but add necessary layers and elements to story. They make a world of sense, and they help advance the story in the match. See main event later on in the night. This having the Davocado kid, or whatever that big dude's name is, come out and help Apollo and have Apollo retain, like, deflated the whole match and ruined every fucking thing. And you want to talk about completely fucking random, there you go. Like, yeah, obviously you were getting to this point that Apollo was going to win the title. Cool beans. But this match felt like it could have been a whole hell of a lot better than what it actually was. And just as it was starting to get good, the run-in happened. And it ruined everything. The Raw Women's Championship match. I was looking at this match at this point, and I'm like, okay, it's got Asuka and Rhea Ripley. Like, this show really needs this match to deliver. And I want to be clear. I enjoy Asuka, and I appreciate that Rhea Ripley is different.
She acts different. She conducts herself different. Cool. I appreciate that these ladies clearly went out there and tried their hardest. This shit didn't work. The pacing was bad. It was slow. It was laborious. It was nothing that they did that was terrible. It just didn't do much. Yeah, you got to the right place where the right person wins, da da da, but you feel like this happened a year too late. And maybe it's because people were expecting somebody to run out like a Charlotte or a Becky, I don't know, but I'm just looking at the match itself and I'm like, maybe it's spoiled because Bianca and Sasha on night one was so good, this one just wasn't that? But it was really boring. It wasn't bad. It was boring. And sometimes that's a lot worse. Because at least bad you could have fun with. Bad you could mock. Bad could be entertaining in its own fucking way. But this level of boring? Woo! Not good. So if you're keeping score at home, that's 0 for 6 on the matches. And let's be absolutely clear. 0 for 6 on the matches. They all stunk and underwhelmed and failed to deliver in any type of meaningful way. The WWE took most of all of the good karma they had in night one. Were all but one of the matches delivered in some type of meaningful way and flipped the fucking script on themselves in night two because that's what Vince do, damn it. And then of all things, before you get to the main event, you're going to get that one last thing where you've got Hogan and Titus and here's Bailey, and now you got fans thinking maybe it's going to be Becky Lynch or somebody. It's the fucking Bella Twins. They're prancing around like they're all out of shape. And you're going to sit there and dog out Bailey for the fucking Bella Sluts. Oh! Hashtag Bailey deserved better. Oh my God. So up to this point in time, the pressure was on. And it's all up to the head of the table, the tribal, tribal chief, the closer of WWE, Roman Reigns, and this Universal Championship triple threat. As everything up to this point, like where everything about night one minus one match was really good and felt like it could have been a classic WrestleMania if you had thrown this triple threat onto night one and fucked off all the rest. Now you look at night two and you're saying, man, this feels like one of the worst WrestleManias of the past 20 years. And I don't even know how much that main event's going to be able to save it. Now let's be clear, it didn't totally save it because nothing could. Because everything that came before it was pretty much shit. But this triple threat was fantastic. It was awesome. It was everything you would expect from a match that had the rated R superstar Edge and our tribal chief, the head of the table, Roman Reigns. To all of you that are going to shit on Roman. Oh, he had involvement from main event J. He got interference. It's a triple threat match, assholes. Tell me what Roman did that was against the rules here. Leave it to our current society and political climate to belittle intelligence. Don't knock the head of the table, the tribal chief, for fully leveraging his capacities within the rules. He did nothing illegal. You're going to tell me now that using weapons like what Edge did and Daniel Bryan did, that that was 100% hunky-dory and on board? Fuck you! But all three of the guys in this match, Daniel Bryan included, all did a fantastic job. Talk about the spot at one point where both Edge and Daniel Bryan are trying to put the fucking, the fucking lock on Roman Reigns and they're sitting there start headbutting each other. It was a great visual, like you had a match full of great visuals. And I hate triple threat matches, I really do. I think it's lazy creative, I think it's lazy booking, I think it's really stupid and negligent creative mindset behind the wheel when you book yourself into this spot like this company absolutely did for no fucking reason and yet somehow these guys all three went out there and played their roles to perfection and absolutely made this work like this was a barn burner this is one of the best triple threat matches that i've ever seen in my lifetime and that's saying something like this thing absolutely delivered and then you get to the big grand finale, like the finishing sequence and it was awesome. And my whole thought at the time going into this, I must confess, I thought Daniel Bryan was thrown in the match to have Edge win and have Edge pin Daniel Bryan. Some of you thought that Daniel Bryan was in there for Roman to pin Daniel Bryan. Well, apparently everybody was right and wrong because fuck the world. 
Roman's going to pin both of them. That's why they were both in that match. And as I talked about on Twitter, to you wise asses are going to say, well, Edge technically had Daniel Bryan pin. Did, 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 did. It's clearly stated in the WWE rules, damn you, that when a Canadian challenger has another opponent in a pinning predicament, but then the tribal chief achieves a pinfall on both of them, then like syrup, the pinning combination of the Canadian challenger conducts its ass over to the head of the table, the tribal chief, and it counts as two pinfalls at one time for the defending, reigning, undisputed universal champion of WWE. Did you get that through your text fucking skulls? I must confess. Like, looking at the way the finish was, like, the match worked out great, and the guys were wonderful, and they put on a banger of a performance, and God knows this show fucking needed it. And you made Roman look like a million bucks, as you absolutely should have. But even I got a little quabble with the finish about, you gotta have him pin both of them? I was just Roman strutting and showing off at this point, and I'm down with that, but damn. Like it just kind of speaks to the whole fucking point of it was pointless to put both of these guys in the match against Roman. It worked. They made it work. And credit to all three of them because by God, this show fucking needed them tonight. But it was so great to see Roman. Like even he had the moment where you started hearing some like you suck chance or Roman sucks chance. And it felt like he was going to go into this contained, uncontrolled rage. Like I freaking loved it. Like, I don't know if anybody's a better storyteller in wrestling right now, let alone WWE in wrestling, than Roman Reigns is. And if, and if there is, please call it out. And please be prepared to be put on blast if you come with one of these ham and eggers from the indie scene, or one of these jabronis in AEW or New Japan or NXT or any other stupid ass place like that. But God, this main event. Like all the other shit we had to go through on Sunday night that was so bad and so awful. And it was. It absolutely was. It This main event doesn't make it worth it. Because that was two plus hours of garbage. Steaming, stinking garbage. But that main event was still awesome in and of itself. A five star type of match. Fuck uh, Uncle Dave or Bozo O'Brien or anybody else that tells you it's not. That's a five-star caliber of match. That was a main event that blew the roof off the joint. Like that, at least you could say both main events of both nights really delivered in a big, big way. The difference was this main event on night two salvaged night two for being one of the shittiest portions of a WrestleMania that we've ever seen. Night one was just a great cherry on the top of an already good night. We shouldn't be surprised, though, that WWE couldn't put together two consecutive great nights of shows. They just don't have it in them. And the whole thing of, well, maybe next year they'll go back to one night. You really want them to? Because then you're talking about a five-hour pay-per-view? I don't know about that. But then you say, well, then they'll just do two nights. You're going to fill up fucking that shrine to Jerry Jones for two different nights? You put fans through two nights? Like, this company can't do that. Like one four-hour show with 10-ish matches, like pick your absolute best ones and roll with them. Imagine if this show had been one night, four hours, like in your last two matches would have been Bianca and Sasha and then this triple threat. Or you did this and then you mixed the Miz and Bad Bunny match in between. Like you could have had an all-time banger WrestleMania if you picked and chose your spots better. It ended up still being an enjoyable weekend. But it was largely carried by the emotion and the joy from night one and closing it out strong at the end of night two. Because that sandwich of night two in between was a lot of garbage. God, that sucked. Y'all couldn't even give Tamina a frickin' WrestleMania moment. The hell? You couldn't even give the Fiend a WrestleMania moment. He was literally burned alive and he's getting revenge against his harshness by frickin' losing after one RKO! If that ain't buried, what the fuck is buried even anymore? God, that was stupid. <laughs> Breakfast Club rules, bitches. And you had Breakfast Club and Fortunate Four with Edge and Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns still in the fucking main event. It was fantastic. Oh, my God. Woo. 
Well, at least I can say this. Night two, I only really had expectations of one big thing, and it delivered that. I certainly will never choose to go back and watch anything else that happened on night two, because it was really, really bad. This main event, though, if you didn't watch it, you definitely, definitely should. And that's all you should watch from night two, I promise you.